Welcome to the Museum in Washington, D.C., and power to the interns. My name is Jill Geisler, Loyola University Chicago professor and Museum Institute Fellow in Women's Leadership. We are all here today because we care about one thing, and that's workplace integrity. It's a concept that simply says we want people to work in atmospheres that are free from harassment and discrimination and filled with opportunity. It all started not long ago at the Power Shift Summit right here at the museum in January, where we heard from powerful voices. Why don't you listen? Our collective challenge for today's Power Shift Summit is to address the problem of sexual misconduct in newsrooms and media companies and to identify solutions for creating meaningful and sustainable change. The most vulnerable, however you define that term, it could be through being a minority, through being a woman, through being young, through being economically disempowered. If they are systematically and structurally given a voice in news meetings or somehow within the organization, these problems would, we wouldn't all be sitting here today because there is sometimes a predatory nature, uh, this kind of predatory culture in which young women feel like they have to acquiesce to do certain things just even while they're still students to get an interview, to get an internship, and even to get a conversation with someone. We should be talking about industry patterns. Mm -hmm. This stuff has been going on forever. And one of the things I worry about now with my graduate students who are primarily female, is they are not going to these big organizations with their first jobs. They're going to small newsrooms around the country. And we're not having conversations the way I think we need to with them about how they protect themselves in those environments. This kind of diversity of thought and participation comes because you care and you make the effort to do it. Oh, are we making an effort today? We have a panel of experts this panel focused on the importance of universities preparing our youngest employees and potential employees. And Maya, you were with us at the Power Shift Summit representing the National Women's Law Center. It was very clear that it is our youngest that are the most vulnerable. That's absolutely right. And I think as we discuss this issue today, what's important to remember is that the law just provides a bare minimum of what universities, of what employers should be doing to empower and protect um, and create self safe and equitable workplaces. That doesn't mean that universities and employers couldn't be doing more and shouldn't be doing more to protect these vulnerable workers. Lisa Schnall, you and the EEOC have been focused on youth initiative for quite some time. It's something very important to you. It is. In 2004, we launched our Youth at Work initiative to help educate young workers about their rights and responsibilities at work, but also to help employers create positive work experiences for young adults. And, and what's the biggest message you would have to universities? To universities, I'm really excited. I know we have representatives on the panel, and I'm really excited to hear about the steps that universities can and are taking to help students understand their rights in the workplace, both when they're uh, doing internships and also certainly after they graduate in the hopes that other universities can share in their best practices and we can all learn from each other. So sitting beside me is Cordelia James. You are the future, right? Tell us about yourself. Um, well, I am a journalism student at American University and I also write for The Eagle, which is our student publication. In the past, I have interned at The Telegraph back in my hometown of Macon, Georgia and I'm looking forward to continue to work in newsrooms in the future. And as you have heard so much conversation now about the Me Too movement and concern about sexual harassment in organizations, what do you as a student feel that you deserve going into the workplace? I feel as though um, preparation is so important. And I feel as though, like, while I'm at school, like, we focus a lot on being able to prepare ourselves for different kind of diff difficult situations, but, like, whether it's um, whatever college culture and student life, but there isn't enough emphasis on how we can prepare in that workplace that we're striving to, become, like, intern at. So I feel like whether it's just talking to us a little bit more about how we should be able to communicate with others and what is expected of us, um, I feel like it should be emphasized. We'll do that today. How's that? 
You know, for a lifetime in my career, I took part in career days and career nights and conversations, and never once did we bring up sexual harassment. We talked about how to prepare your resume and dress for success and how to have a good work ethic. And we realize now that universities and employers need to do more. So I sent the word out to other educators and asked if anyone had raised their game in terms of preparing students. Got a great answer from the University of North Texas's Mayborn School. Take a look at what they're doing. The university has an obligation to um, create and maintain an educational environment that is free of discrimination or harassment. I think it's really important that if we're going to be sending students out into the workplace, we send them to a place where they not only get great experience, but they're treated well. It's very important for interns and students and faculty, staff, anyone on campus to have this information readily available for them. Having these guiding principles, just feeling that the university and the professors are trying to help me make sure that it's a positive environment is something that, that does make me feel reassured. I think the brochure helps to set expectations. Um, it helps to set expectations for students and for companies who see it, it also helps to set expectations for them. I feel like we've been successful in communicating this topic uh, effectively and clearly to our students and our interns. We would like our students to know that they are also part of the culture in the workplace. They're not just subjected to the culture. I think it's really helpful that the Mayborn and the university are giving us this communication specifically to interns addressing ways in which we might feel uncomfortable in a workplace which is a little more specific than what I've received previously. We want to catch them at this point where they're just learning how to be a new professional um, and make them resistant to discrimination and harassment and make them intolerant of sexual harassment so that the future workplace will be a workplace that exists without discrimination or harassment. It is important to talk to students about this and let them know that you're there for them, that they can come to you if there's a problem. This is about social change and the conversation is really pushing social change. So I think we're going to see some change. Now when we see it and exactly what it looks like, um, I can't say. Part of it will be just making people more aware in general, always having that communication out there, just like the Mayborn is doing right now, um, doing this in every situation, making this the norm. For me, it's an interesting time because it's a time for the, for the nation to engage in a real conversation that says we haven't fixed this issue. Amy Eisman, Director of American University's Journalism School, we haven't fixed the problem. We have work to do. What are you doing? Well, what I'm doing, what the university has been working on Title IX and has working groups on this for, for you know, at least uh, more than a decade and has policy and online training and the students can um, do all kinds of training modules. What we're doing in journalism is really interesting. We're bringing in uh, professionals to speak to the classes. We just had Tracy Grant in from the Washington Post a few weeks ago. Um, we're looking at EEOC um, uh, training for the classroom. Um, and one of the things that my class is doing, every spring we look at um, one project in depth, and my students voted that the project that they wanted to look at in depth this semester is the Me Too movement. And I just thought it, what I'd tell you about some of the ideas of the stories that they're covering, mm. because this gives you an idea of how difficult a topic this is to navigate. Some of their stories are safe training for bartenders for when students go to bars. Some of them have to do with the place of race in the movement because this movement really started with Toronto Burke um, before. Dating and relationships, how they've changed. Consent apps, what do we do about them? Politicians in Me Too. And then one I think that probably is the most interesting for us is the generational gap. We're trying to talk to people about the different generations in one family, how they look at this Me Too movement. You know, when you talk about how challenging it can be, there's also the question of the role of men in this conversation and Jim Dickinson from Loyola, Maryland. How do you enter this conversation as a good ally mm -hmm. and a comfortable place? Yeah, well, I, I think we're here today because there have been some brave voices recently who have spoken up um, when many have been hesitant to do so in the past. So how do we honor that, I think, is, is the question going forward. And um, as, as a man, as a, as a white male, I think one of the ways that, that I can do that and that we all need to do this is to be overtly feminist. And, and when I use that word, I really mean that opportunity, 
the way people are treated cannot be based on gender. And we need to strive for making sure our university environments demonstrate that and that um, workplaces do that. And then when students either are impacted by harassment or uh, some discrimination or when they see it happening, they need to have the tools and the skill sets. Um, and that takes everybody, men and women included. So you oversee the career development of students. Mm -hmm. How have you changed or are changing mm -hmm. the approach to make certain that harassment and discrimination are a core part of it? Yeah, so we've done a lot of the same things you referenced before around building great resumes and interview skills and getting students ready for the job. And one of the things that we're going to do is revise our interview training, where previously we have addressed what do you do in an interview when you get uh, an inappropriate question? How do you answer that? How do you respond? Now we want to hit this more directly and talk about once you're in an internship or in a first job, what happens when, when you experience this behavior or when you see it happening? Um, and utilizing the university as your resource. We have Title IX coordinators. We have our human resources professionals, faculty members when there's a four-credit internship. So we want to be really explicit, explicit with students that even if they don't know what they should do in a particular situation, they have those resources on campus to take advantage of. Lynn Adrian. In that video that we just saw, there was a lot of passion in your voice, and I, I remember you clearly from that day. Passion is also built on some anger. This shouldn't be happening, and you're concerned about your students. I am. Um, one thing that the Newhouse School is known for, and we take great pride in, is that we have trained our students to be assets to the workplaces to which they go. We want them to be prepared, and we want them to know how to uh, come in in a very professional way. We've had very little conversation with them about what they should expect from their employers. And that is, uh, I believe that is the aha moment for me as the Me Too movement was starting, that there is very little conversation about what their rights are uh, and what they can question it, as they go into internships or into their first jobs. We have prepared them for professional behavior um, in an interview situation, even if there's uh, somebody who is not behaving appropriately. Mm -hmm. But we have not talked about what is appropriate behavior for them, for, they, for their expectation in the workforce, and that's something that we have to talk more about. And something that was made very clear at the summit and in our summit report is that harassment and discrimination are inextricably linked and it's very important to talk about that intersection because if you happen to be a man or a woman and a person of color or if you are gay or straight, all of those things can compound the challenges that you have. How do we make sure that people don't see this as just an issue for straight white women? I think, first of all, that the people coming into workplaces for the first time, whether as an intern or as a new employee, have to understand that they have certain rights and have a voice. And that if they can't speak up or feel hesitant to speak up in the workplace themselves, as a university, we still need to offer support. We're not just releasing you out into the world and saying uh, bon chance. <laughs> we need to have a pipeline going back so that if someone has a question, they can talk to us. Mm -hmm. uh, identify certain faculty members who want to keep that connection going. and provide strategies, mm -hmm. if, uh, if appropriate, on how to negotiate uncomfortable situations. Well, let's go back to what we are entitled to as interns. What does the law say that we are entitled to by rights? You want to take that one first? Sure. So legally, unpaid interns may not have rights under the law. However, that doesn't stop employers, and certainly employers have decided to make their policies apply to everyone that works for them, including interns and other who may be vulnerable. So I'll just add to that and say, you know, under Title IX, universities have responsibilities to their students. And under Title VII, which is our primary workplace discrimination law, employers have obligation to their employees. The problem is when you look at whether interns are paid or unpaid, right? So generally speaking, paid interns can be treated as employees, and so employers should Treat, be treating them and giving them the same protections as they would to their regular employees. Unpaid interns, as Lisa said, 
don't have those protections under federal law. That doesn't mean that some states haven't taken steps to do that. And as Lisa said, that employers and universities shouldn't be acting to extend to them those protections. But one thing I just wanted to add is that what I really liked in the University of North Texas video is they talk not only about educating the students about their expectations and their rights, but setting expectations for those employers. Mm -hmm. Because sexual harassment and discrimination are about power. And dismantling those power structures means real systemic and cultural change if we're going to prevent this from happening in the first place. And it is incumbent upon the institutions and people with power to be the agents of those change. You cannot put that on students individually, right? If the universities are demanding that employees treat, that employers treat their interns with respect and protect them, then that will affect change much more quickly than putting that on the shoulders of the students themselves. When I ask about the law, I think I'm almost making you uncomfortable because we're talking about compliance, right? Do this so you don't get sued. And that's really not where we want people to be. We want people to be thinking about it as do this because it's the right thing to do. What, Lisa, what advice would you have for Cordelia? And Cordelia, what questions do you have for the experts? <laughs> Um, first of all, I think it's wonderful that you're participating in this panel and that you have employment opportunities while you're a student because getting on the job experience is one of the best ways to prepare you when you actually enter the workforce. Um, I would encourage you to be an informed and engaged intern and to be an informed and engaged employee. So if you've got an employee handbook, read it. If you have questions, talk to the individual that's listed in the handbook, talk to your supervisor, talk to another trusted adult, maybe an intern coordinator at your university, and don't hesitate to ask questions. I have said multiple times in the past week, there are no dumb questions. Any questions you have, whether it's related to the work you're doing, the way you're being treated, the way you may be seeing other people being treated, those are all good questions and the answers may help benefit not only you, but also your colleagues. And I'm glad that um, I once again really appreciate that I am able to kind of add to the conversation, even though I can't necessarily speak for all interns everywhere, but mm -hmm. I do feel as though like maybe I can touch on some of the voices that are out there and everything. And um, I do feel as though it's like I think going on with what you said earlier about even though unpaid interns aren't necessarily um, given those same rights of, under the law and everything, that how important it is that in, at the end of the day they're still being able to contribute to these different organizations and that they deserve that same like respect on MACLE as well. And so thank you for touching that. All right. What kind of conversations are going on at the university level now about changing intern preparation? Are we where we need to be? I'll leave that to any of you to, to answer. Um, I, I do think that we've done pretty well in terms of Title IX training, but I think in terms of training people for the, um, uh, the internship in the newsroom, that's, a, that's our next area, which UNT was talking about. Um, I had a conversation with interns yesterday, I'm supervising some, and I found myself saying, and is everybody okay? And I probably wouldn't have asked that question um, in that way and meaning it the way I meant it. Um, How did you mean it? I meant, you know, because usually it's, well, they talk to me or they give me a job or I'm sitting here or I'm not or I'm really great or I love the person, but I wanted to know, are you feeling comfortable? Um, is, is everything, are, are you feeling that you're, it's not just a matter of respect and job duties and responsibilities, but it's, are you feeling comfortable? And it was, um, a resounding yes I am and of course I'll give people an opportunity afterwards but there, I think there's an awareness um, in, in fairness faculty are very much attuned and trained to how students are feeling and acting mm -hmm. in a classroom I'm not sure in a newsroom there's that much um, understanding of how students are we will zero in just by you know somebody blinking in a different way and I'm not sure that that the newsrooms know that as well. That's why I love the way that you set this up, talking about how it's what newsrooms and um, classrooms can teach each other. Um, with our, our career development office is having a session on campus next month, talking specifically about the Me Too movement and uh, how to address issues of harassment, sexual and otherwise, um, what to do to feel more comfortable and what the basic definitions are. Mm -hmm. That's, and I think that is tremendous. That's something that our dean has uh, an initiative that she took on herself, and that's a good place to start. I also think that individually, as I was saying before, uh, as faculty, 
we need to open up pipelines so that people can have this conversation or know that it's all right to have this conversation with us. As I think I told you before, I liken it to being a parent of a preteen and you're driving in the car and you decide you want to have the talk with them <laughs> and they look at you and think, can I climb out of the sunroof to get away from you because <laughs> this is so uncomfortable. Um, you have to at least open the door and then allow space for another time to have a private, discreet conversation in a way that they'll be comfortable. Well, when you talk about discomfort, Jim, I was doing a career night uh, moderation at Loyola University of Chicago. We had young uh, alums who had recently started in the workplace. We had aspiring new employees of the students. And we're talking about all the positive things. And then I could, I knew I had to bring this up. And it was like changing the vibe in the room by saying, okay, now I want to address something. Let's talk about harassment. And you could just feel the room change. And I know that, you know, we want to tell people you can do it. Uh, this is great. Go out there and, and rule the world. And now I'm going to scare you. And I also thought there was a little bit of guilt. We're bringing it up as though we have no control over it ourselves. If I'm still warning you about it, it means I haven't done enough. So it may be a little challenging. Yeah. I I've thought about what will it look like to, to say we've, we're making progress mm -hmm. on this on campus. And I think a lot of us were starting these new conversations. Uh, and at the beginning, I expect it to be a bit uncomfortable and th there'll be some crickets in the room. Um, and there's, this is a, it would be qualitative evidence, but I think if we looked at the quality of conversations, people willingness to engage and ask questions, I think we could, there's, there's a social scientist out there who's more brilliant than I, who can figure out how to do this. But um, t just to see, Phase one is let's start the conversation. Let's be open. Let's be persistent with that. Phase two, then, what's the quality? And are people actually confronting this directly and talking about it openly? So when career professionals like yourself, who have an association uh, of academics, get together, is this an issue now? Or are, we, are you going to be the one who's reminding them that it is? Well, I think it's, it's really, it's initiatives like this one that have really brought us all to the table and now I think I think each one of us now we have our networks of colleagues mm -hmm. in career services that that we get to bring this experience back to uh, and I just think it's it's a really it's an exciting opportunity born out of a crisis and we have to take advantage of that and, and do everything we can we've started the conversation immediately as all of this came to light and we've started having sessions on campus and speakers come in and and it it is the moment Mm -hmm. And um, I'm proud of journalism, actually, and, and communication schools for moving forward, realizing this is something that we have to take care of. I keep thinking about, about um, Lisa and Maya, and we say this is the moment. This has been your moment for a long time. Um, are you seeing more interest from universities and employers in, in finding ways to take advantage of resources or filing complaints? There's been interest from employers across the board. It's hard to single out one industry because as we've seen in the news, this has arisen and as we've known at EOC for a while in every industry, but I think there are employers in every industry who want to do the right thing, who want to prevent harassment from happening on the front end. And if unfortunately a situation arises, they want to address it effectively and put a stop to it and ensure it doesn't happen again. In terms of charges, we haven't seen a big uptick yet in harassment complaints, but this moment in the culture is relatively recent and to the extent that employees feel comfortable of course they have a right to go directly to their employers those aren't statistics that we would have access to so there are a lot of different complaint options and one of them of course is to come to us so i would just add that you know as a national legal advocacy organization for women and girls we have certainly seen a tremendous increase in people um, reaching out to us for assistance, for information, um, wanting to know what their rights are, whether or not they're planning to pursue a lawsuit, mm -hmm. right? There's a real need for education. People just don't have that basic information about what their rights and options are. Um, the National Women's Law Center is also housing the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, and since January 1st, when the fund launched, we have received over 1,700 requests for assistance just on workplace sexual harassment mm -hmm. issues from all over the country, all kinds of workplaces and industries. So that shows and sort of confirms things that we already knew, but just the sheer volume and the, the demand and sort of the need that's out there tells us that this is a huge problem um, and it's a systemic problem that needs sustained attention. 
And I'll also say we're also getting a lot of requests for assistance from employers who want to do the right thing, who want to go beyond mere compliance, which is so critical if we're going to change culture and systems to prevent this from happening in the first place. What kind of everyday conversations, not formal training, but everyday conversations, how can we embed this so it isn't just you're going to go to training and then, you know, that training is over, now we all go back to our normal lives. What kind of everyday conversations would you recommend at the university level we'd be having? In classrooms, uh, in hallways, in dorms, what do you think? What would you start out with, Cordelia? Um, I think it's just being able to, uh, like, whether or not, like, so for example, if I'm talking to, like, my roommate or someone and we overall like me and my roommate we get along really well like we understand what our boundaries are and um, like who we are as individuals and everything so if I were to have a conversation with her about um, what I find to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. then it's as simple as saying I don't like XYZ mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and so it doesn't always have to be like this really like big <laughs> structure because in some cases someone could just feel as though they're being forced to do this and at the yeah. end of the day they can walk away and it, everything doesn't really change, but being able to have these casual conversations and just simply letting people know, like ahead of time, like this isn't what yeah. I'm okay with, and then continuing that afterwards, I think. Sometimes really in your role, it's giving advice to people who may be talking to you about something that they've experienced. You know, they're at their part-time job or or their internship, and you can be the one who helps guide them toward a good response to a bad situation. Mm. Exactly. I would just add, I think one thing that's really critical in all this is to empower people to be good allies and um, what I like to call upstanders, not just bystanders. Upstanders, it I like that. It implies being a little more active um, because now, because of the conversations we've been having over the last five months in particular, people I think are more aware of these issues, recognize these sort of power plays and people being made to feel uncomfortable in particular situations in a way that they didn't before, but I think a lot of people still hesitate because they don't know what they can or should do in that situation, and that includes men. Mm -hmm. Really critical allies in this work. Advice? In terms of universities and colleges, I think it all starts at student orientation. That is the first opportunity, and my understanding is that schools are providing bystander intervention and other information to students at that point but ensuring that that's a beginning and not an end. There are, as we were talking earlier, there are particularly popular periods where career services offices are active, whether it's during active recruitment periods, whether it's before spring break or before the summer when students are looking for internships or jobs. And these are all great opportunities when students are already have a work mindset to add this in. Also just in, in uh, classes to the extent that it's relevant to the subject matter, whether it's journalism, whether it's other subjects as well, taking an opportunity to let students know that there are rights that are available to them at work and how to enforce them. And also, um, with respect to the retaliation, that the law prohibits employers from punishing employees for engaging in their rights. For example, for complaining about harassment or helping a colleague complain about harassment. Your uh, an environment that allows for maybe subtle, inappropriate comments and where people can do that without any conversation I think can set the stage for more egregious acts. Especially if it's your professor. Absolutely. So um, I think one of the responsibilities of universities today is to give students the skills for transferable skills for professional success. One of those is how do you handle conflicts and bring up difficult situations. So to be able to recount the facts first and say this is what I saw, this is, this is how I interpreted it, or this is how I think it affected that person. And to be able to bring that to somebody directly in a non-confrontational tone, but to have a direct conversation. Um, those are the kinds of skills that we can teach in many different areas that then when students witness something uh, along the lines of harassment, th it triggers and they say, well, this is a moment that I need to use those skills. And there's also an opportunity to integrate this in, um, in the classroom itself in certain subjects. Shortly after the Power Shift Summit, I was on campus and I was uh, co-teaching uh, an ethics uh, class, an ethics seminar for three hours. And we focused on uh, some of the uh, media conflicts like Lynn Thrush at the New York Times, mm -hmm. et cetera, and talked about how the larger issue of this, not just in terms of how people are personally affected, is how it affects the, the practice of journalism mm -hmm. and our integrity 
and our ethics in terms of how the audience will view us. Mm -hmm. That we have a responsibility if we're going to cover these issues that, we, that our own homes need to be clean. Right. Amy, you get the last word. I think that the most important thing in the classroom is honesty. And just before I came here today, we were having an honest conversation about the ethics of, of how to have diverse voices in a newsroom and, and, and how to have an honest conversation in a classroom where three of the students could say, well, that was three dudes on a panel and we need some women to come in here. And that was, we all laughed and thought it was great, but it was a, it was a nice, safe place to have a conversation like that on this topic. And while the museum focuses on journalism, the tips that we have here really are designed for educators in any field, correct? So with that, we wrap up our first session of the Power Shift conversation on power to the interns, the university view. Next, we're going to take the employer view, so stay tuned.